I'd like to call the Northampton Disability Commission meeting to order. It is 5 p.m. Um, and um, my name is Hannah Coyle. I have thus far been the vice chair. I have been informed that our that the former chair, Tori Eklund, has chosen to resign. Um, so the new chair um, effective today. Um, I'd like to start the meeting um, with introductions. Um, we can go this way. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm Ruth McGrath, secretary. Okay. 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 Mike Nagy, member. I'm Rich Parsley, I was superintendent of DPW. City Councilor Marianne Larch. Heather Shaughnessy, APA Coordinator. Hannah Coyle, Chair. And you just need to announce that this meeting is being recorded. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this, this meeting is being recorded and videotaped. This meeting wasn't posted, um, so the commission can't take any um, votes, but we can still meet to have a discussion. It is being taped and videoed, um, so um, just so you know that, so nothing can be voted on. Do we have a quorum anyway? Yeah, but you can't. It was not posted. Yeah, there is a quorum. We have five people here. There's right, only nine quorum. quorum. Well, I got six years old. No, five because there's nine members, but actually you don't even need five because Tori resigned and Dan Langer has resigned. So you you have more than a quorum. Wait a minute, can I ask, did Tori give any of the why she resigned? Um, I can read what she sent to the mayor. She forwarded it to me as well. Um, dear Mayor in Arkowitz, I am letting you know that I am resigning my position on the Northampton Disability Commission for personal reasons. I appreciate the opportunity to serve and wish the commission the best in their future endeavors. Sincerely, Tori Eklund. So, thank you, Tori, for having served and yeah. worked with the uh, commission. Yeah. Sometimes people have busy lives. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and you only can do what you can do. Right. So, so thank you for letting me interrupt that. Oh, that's that's all right. <clears throat> thank you very much for your announcement. Well, well said and well appreciated that she submitted the comm mm -hmm. uh, her commentary. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, we don't have any members of the public present. Um, so let's see. Um, um, today for our guest speaker, we have um, Mr. Richard Parsoletti, um, who works with the DPW. Um, he's here to talk about uh, winter snow events and uh, removal and possible um, any improvements that we can make to this topic for the city. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Our, our next order of business. Oh, not yet. Who's going to speak? Oh, we're going to give him that option. Oh, no, that one? Okay. Oh. Sorry. No, go right in. So, what I took the liberty of doing today was making uh, some copies of a little packet. So this is this is a packet of information that I gathered from a couple of different locations. It's actually all located. On, all this information is located on the DPW's webpage. Or actually, it's uh, right there on, on the bottom of the page. Yeah. It's three quarters of the way down. It says visit www.northamptonma.gov/backslash/snow uh, or, or comprehensive snow information. So start with. Snow removal in Northampton is a very complicated issue, as well as complicated for a lot of other communities in Massachusetts and in New England. 
but we seem to manage to do it uh, pretty well. But obviously, I think there's always room for improvement uh, in a lot of different places. But um, the reason I put this packet together is to give you just whenever you instead of having to go and sit in front of the web, if you want to just sit here and read this, it kind of is a good overview. Um, there's a lot of uh, question and answers. There's this, this flyer on the front that was generated by the mayor's office that was actually dis uh, distributed to uh, different businesses in town. And at one time, we actually put these flyers all on cars at one time. But we found that these flyers, um, and the second flyer, which is underneath the code red on page three, which was a pamphlet that we actually used to put that on uh, people's cars. So the police off the police department actually one year took all these pamphlets and put them all on cars they ticketed um, and they gave them to businesses so they could hand them out. We didn't think that in the end run after the following year we did a little uh, analysis of how many cars were towed and it didn't really seem to make much difference. So they don't do that anymore, but that's still part of this package because I think it's some, just a lot of information in here. And if there's um, and the page four has just basically uh, questions and answers. Um, and uh, after that, those three pages, there's a section about filing a claim for property damage, which also includes mailbox claims, which is a lot of claims that you get in, in Ward 6 and Ward 7. Um, you get to does, does, does that claim, is the procedure the same or it goes to our council clerk, or is it going right to the board? It, go, it goes to the it goes to the city department. Clerk. No, it goes to the city clerk, and the city clerk actually to Wendy. It, it used to go to the city clerk and to Maya, but I believe at the end of the year they changed that because Maya, the city insurance company, was because our council clerk member Medora used to handle it. Correct. So it went from going to council clerk and then actually handing out fifty dollars vouchers to everyone who ever got the mailbox broken. Yeah. Whether or not it was from the truck hitting it or from the snow smashing it, yeah. to back to having the city's insurance company handle the claims that they would for a water and sewer claim, which is a much longer process, and you have to actually investigate whether it was the snow plow that hit the, right. or the snow that hit the mailbox. I think Maya kind of gave up figuring that you're not really going to know if it was the snow plow or the snow. So it's, but I believe it's back to the original status of where it's investigated by the city ourselves, and then we actually determine whether or not. Okay, so the procedures of what I'm hearing now goes to Wendy Mazna, our city clerk. That's where the application is made out, and then if she sends it to the insurance company. No, nope, it says right here. Such claims shall be submitted in writing to the city clerk's office within 30 days of the date of alleged damage. Okay. The Department of Public Works will investigate the circumstances involved and may authorize a flat reimbursement of $50 towards the purchase and installation of uh, a standard United States Postal Service acceptable box. So, so when do you, so you will, so if you had a, if your mailbox got broken, if I broke your mailbox by accident, because that's why you're screaming, you would, I would say, yeah, I Dunkin' know. Donuts in a donut. So you would actually, in writing, you would write a letter to the clerk's office, city clerk, and the city clerk reported to the Department of Public Works, do an investigating, and then we would determine whether or not. Okay, so the insurance company does not handle not it. Not anymore. Oh, that I know not because there was a lot of complaints not anymore, about that. There was, it was too, it was too long. It was yeah. too ridiculous. We weren't getting your mail, so it went back to this way. So, so just, there isn't a form that you have to make out. No, you just have to send a letter oh, writing. That's good to know that. Yeah. I'm responsible for the um, house numbering signs. It used to be through Triad um, yeah. and still through our department, but um, now we do it solely. And um, a number of people will tell me that their sign needs to be replaced because the small file got it. So is that something somebody could put a claim in for? They probably could, but I don't know if that would be. Isn't that tricky though? Because there's it's, no price on that. It's not going to be. It's treated. a donation. No, it's five dollars. It's not a donation. I don't think it would yeah, be. Yeah, but treated. it's five bucks. Yeah, but then that person has to pay five dollars again to have it I replaced. Did. Yeah. So because what I'm saying is, I was never told by Crystal that they would replace it. Well, they she said you just have to give the money again. Yeah, that's right. So what I'm saying is if somebody's sign gets hit by a plow, why can't they get a reimbursement? They, they can. The question is what's going to be the avenue they're going to take? Are they going to have to go through? Right. You're going to have to go through the city clerk's office no matter what. Right. The question is where does it go from there? Does it go to Maya? Because it's not considered a mailbox claim. 
it's a separate, it's a separate, it's two separate things. So a mailbox claim is just for a United States Postal Service mailbox. If someone had a sign from the triad folks made and it got broken, that would be treated, I would think, as a as a regular claim for personal property damage. So that that's a good question, and I think we need to find an answer to that question. Yeah, because mine was split at the top, the number plate part of it was split right in half. That, that used to be purchased, all those signs and um, posts and all that was through a grant which doesn't exist anymore. So um, people do have to pay the $5 for a sign. So is that something like you're going to investigate or do I check with somebody else? I think what I'll do is I'll send an email to Joe Cook and actually yeah, ask him his opinion because yeah. he's very knowledgeable about this. What, what avenue that should be sure. so Thank you. Thank you. My question is when you're talking about the signage, Patty, that you're talking about, which also has the signage of your number and the metal pole, mm -hmm. the mailbox, they are not cheap. Plus, you have the poles, the wooden poles, with the arm that comes out, those are not cheap. Versus a number at five bucks. I mean, you're looking at heavy money here, about seventy-five to hundred dollars on mailboxes. And if you can recall, Richard, on Ryan Road, how many mailboxes were destroyed in Pertsburg Road? It was huge. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, mailboxes only last for so long, and they can only take so much snow slapping against them. And we have a lot of events. Right. Yeah, last winter, we, last winter, for example. They did very good though last so winter. Last winter, we also had, most of the snow was very light and fluffy, so you don't have any weight behind it when you have uh, snow that's at 32 degrees or 33 or 34 degrees, and then it turns to rain, you end up having a lot of slush, and that's when you have the heavy wet snow. So the plow trucks actually need to go faster to actually move the snow off the street, and thus, that's where the mailbox is get damaged. It's not done intentionally. It's just that when you're trying to move snow, and you're um, trying to get it over the snow bank that already exists, and the snow is wet and sloppy from a mix, precipitation mix, that's when a lot of the damage happens. And not only does it damage mailboxes, it damages vehicles, it oh, damages yeah. curbing and everything else. <coughs> when they were coming down Route 66, I mean, Patty, the snow actually flunked right into our pickup truck. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can go flying, yeah. yeah. I'm serious. So yeah. just to give you, I'll let you just give you a quick brief overview of how snow and ice operations work. Um, and basically, how snow and ice operations work, obviously, is that I'm in tune to the forecast before every storm. So typically, in the wintertime, the DPW is staffed 24 hours a day. There's a the day shift, which I work the day shift. Um, with the majority of the crew, we have a shift that works from 3 to 11, which is one individual monitors all the roadways, uh, monitors um, the weather, and then we have another gentleman that works 11 to 7 who does the same thing. They will go out and they will take care of uh, areas that freeze up because of runoff during the day, things get slippery, uh, dispatch calls us out and we take care of it. So there's always personnel available in the wintertime. So when there's a pending snowstorm, um, potential plowable event, we basically um, spend a lot of time in preparation a day or two before the storm. Um, we prepare all our standards that we have so we can actually go ahead and put out a chemical, which we use a, a combination of uh, rock salt and uh, ice beam on two, which is uh, a uh, product that's made from with magnesium chloride and also has um, brewer's, uh, brewer's yeast in it. So it's a pretty, it's very tolerable uh, in the environment versus just using straight calcium chloride, which is what we used to use here. So, Prior to every storm, even if it's going to be a, a dusting, mm -hmm. um, we put down, we have uh, five chemical routes that we travel around the city with, which are all the main arterial routes. Uh, and then we do secondary routes. We do all the school parking lots. Uh, we do all the uh, <coughs> smaller side streets that are uh, used a lot, for example, like Prospect Avenue, because of the uh, ambulance runs and things of that nature. So once the city is completely treated, then that allows um, traffic to flow safer, but it also prevents a bond of the snow bonding to the pavement. So really what, what salt really is intended to do, it's really intended to actually create a brine solution between the pavement and whatever type of precipitation you have. So 
when you have snow, sleet, or freezing rain. Mm -hmm. Without that salt there, the, and the, the uh, road is below 32 degrees, you're going to have freezing conditions and cars will be slipping everywhere. So the salt actually acts as a solution that when it melts, it actually pr prevents that from happening, which allows cars. So when you're, you know, you're driving on the roads with salt, you see the, the tires and stuff is flying off underneath your tires. That's because that brine solution is actually working and the salt's doing its job. So typically when we are predicted to get more than an inch of snow, then after we put all our chemical out, we decide that we're going to plow. And so the chemical root operation consists of about seven people. Plowing operations consist of 55 boats. How many private? Uh, we have seven vehicles, seven private vehicles, and the rest are all public works employees. And that includes employees from the water division, wastewater division, parks and cemetery, highway division. So we use all available personnel to drive all the people, almost all the vehicles we have. So usually plowing operations, uh, it depends what kind of storm it is, but there's been storms where we plow for eight hours, and there's been storms where I've worked 36 hours. So what so, I'm hearing is you take employees off who apparently oh, had to do with cemetery duties because there's none anyways in the winter, not unless somebody passes the light, correct? Yeah. So if you have, for instance, engineers in the head main office, do they come out and plow? Okay. Yeah. So just regular city employees yeah. who are taken off their job. That's correct. And obviously if there's a burial or if there's uh, people still have to stay off the water, uh, wastewater treatment plant, those yeah. staff members stay there. Um, and I utilize some of the staff, not all of them. So during the daytime, the regular shift, the regular operations have to happen in other divisions. Those folks are in those divisions doing those operations, water department, water treatment plant. But we, so we kind of run a smaller snowfall operation between 7 and 3. After 3 o'clock, after those operations are completed in those other divisions, then I take everybody back and we start to plow everything. How many people can fit into a plow? Into a truck? Into a plow truck. <coughs> Two? Well, it looks like you and I are not going together. <laughs> 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 most of the trucks have bucket seats. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Most of them, the newer vehicles have bucket seats. Some of the older ones have bench seats, but they probably don't have seat belts. Is it cold in there? No, man, it's not. It's big enough, it's yeah. So, so once plowing operations begin, we basically work from the beginning of the storm until the end of the storm. So the, the seven folks that have started in the very beginning of the sanding operation, when it's just you know, dusting to an inch of snow. They have worked X amount of hours, plus they will continue to work the rest of the hours like the rest of us can come in after we uh, are called in at one inch. I'm typically here from the beginning to the end, which is really, I don't seem to be able to get away from that. So, but it's, rapid response is very important. I mean, I, I worked here for a long time where I think we did get rapid response right, and we ended up having six, seven inches of snow on the ground before you would see the bottom down the street. So we've eliminated that. But that requires the department to be really ramped up with um, a lot of people involved very quickly. We have to work a lot of long hours. So at the end, you know, we're tired and people's uh, tempers on the street because of the street conditions or people because their driveway got plowed or because the sidewalk got filled and can be frustrated as well as drivers can be frustrated because they're exhausted. So sometimes that's not a good mix, but for the most part, we, we typically have had pretty good luck. In How many hours? Can they actually get behind a plow? Is there a law? Like truck drivers, they only can work? Well, there, there is a law uh, for commercial CDL holders. I'm a CDL holder. I'm supposed to only be driving 16 hours straight. But because we end up having we are emergency situations, if we are becoming exempt, the rule is not enforced. Typically, mo typically my, my whole thing has been with the folks is that if you're tired, go somewhere and take a nap. You got it. Right? it's not really worth it to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to send people home in the middle of a snowstorm and have another group of people come in yeah. to plow because we don't have another group of people. Right. What we have is what we have. We have about 93 full-time employees in the department and you know, about two-thirds of those folks are involved in snow and ice operations. So they would have to go all the way back home. Some of them live out of town. Correct. Why cannot they be accommodated? They are. Oh. They are. We have hot food soup, sandwiches, hot And a coffee. sleeping in area? Yeah, there's okay. people who snooze if they need okay. to. Yeah. I don't know if this is taped. I don't know if this is taped. I was 
going to make an offer, but I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so after, so basically, like I said, the snowstorm can last anywhere from following operations eight to thirty, eight to thirty. The longest I work, I can remember, is about forty hours, thirty-six to forty hours, and that was Valentine's Day storm about five years ago, four years ago. That was wicked. Yeah, that was a, that was a terrible storm. But, but see, that that is so dangerous. It's unhealthy. And your yeah. mind is not right. Well, you're not, but unfortunately, the world that we live in today, yeah, I, I don't think I could call it and say that we're all tired of our going home in the city and not getting involved. Yeah, but that isn't it. It's what doctors say, what is healthy or what is not. It is. It's, you, you're not, your body's not meant to work 24 hours. That's just not how it works. But the reality of municipal? In the reality of municipal operations, we are just one of 300 other 50 municipalities that have the same situation. Oh. So. So after, so after the snowstorm is completed and all the plugs are plowed, um, then we have to turn our eyes to figuring out what we're going to do with all the snow. And typically before, a, when a snowstorm is predicted to, be, to begin, and it's going to be a problem then I will institute the parking ban, which you're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, the parking ban um, is effective only really from 12.01 a.m. until 6 o'clock a.m that particular time frame that it's called for. So I cannot tow cars during the daytime um, unless the mayor uh, declares a state of emergency or the governor declares a state of emergency orders all, all people off the road. Which kind of makes things a little difficult because we have to make sure that we either the snowstorm works all through the middle of the night so we can effectively clean the streets. If that is not the case, then the following night after the snowstorm is over, the parking ban will still be in effect. And then we will do a citywide cleanup, which I will find about eight to ten people to come back after it's all been slept during the daytime. They will come back at eleven o'clock the following night and they'll work until seven. They usually work double the work from eleven to seven. And then seven to three. And they will actually go and they will clean uh, all the local, for example, all the streets off of Elm Street, anywhere where there's a tremendous amount of traffic, um, mm -hmm. all these streets, Market Street. But there's a lot of people that rely upon our street park, uh, rely upon on street parking. So if you have 10 inches of snow, and people's cars are parked there during the daytime, you have all this snow piles going yeah, down, exactly. which, is, which makes it really difficult for folks to get into a parking space, and it makes it hard for people to get their cars out of parking spaces. So at midnight, we're allowed to remove those cars that are in the way, and then we can just clean the streets up and push the snow back. Plus, that's when you have issues from snow going on people's sidewalks already shoveled the storm was yesterday. Now you're coming down my street and you're throwing my sidewalk in again. I really don't like you very much at this moment. So, but it's there, it's a necessity. If you don't do it, what ends up happening is that if we have a winter like we had last year, we have consecutive storms in a row. That snow that is all in between these cars will now melt a little bit during the day and it will freeze solid. So you have cars that will be parked on the side of Walnut Street, for example, that are like this. Yeah. So what happens is that the cars actually start to slide out into the road over a period of time, and then you can't pass emergency vehicles down the street. So that's the reason why we do cleanup. Um, if we need to do it, which typically it happens almost every single time, because the way they work, they end at various different times. So. Well, we appreciate. Yeah. And I know as city councilors, we appreciate everything that the Department of Public Works does during the winter time. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of stress, and it's, you just can't make everybody happy, no, but no. it helps keep everybody safe on our roads. And I think educating the public is extremely important, and especially why our main roads get done before our little roads. That's always the big issue. Well, the, big, the main issue is that there are arterial routes, and they have to, they're the routes that feed the traffic out of the city, and they have to be, they're usually done first. I have to say, they're perfect. I can call them, you know, after the storm, and they've come up and down, up and down Route 66 and wherever, and I have elderly people on on a street, and they need to get to the Cooley Dick or whatever. They go right over, and they'll plow their street. Yeah. They're well, excellent. Yeah, it's, Things have changed a lot. I mean, we're a lot more responsive, I think, than we were yes. many years ago. And I've worked here for 25 years, so I've seen That's the transparency in yeah. the communication. So after after a storm is over and we've done the cleanup, then I have to examine whether or not we're actually going to do snow removal, which your 
you're familiar with, I would imagine by seeing a large snowblower in the crater around town blowing snow into trucks. Mm -hmm. Typically, any snowstorm that's over six inches, we have to start to do snow removal uh, in Florence Center and downtown to make way to remove snow from the meters in order to facilitate people to put money in the meters and for people to be able to park um, to get to shops to, uh, you know, to get to work harder it may be. So that, that operation usually happens at night, so that's another nightly event that we will work uh, 11 to 7, and we usually feel the crew of about 30 people to do that. So we have every single truck, every single five-ton truck that's available to us, plus our two snow blowers, two graders, two bucket loaders, myself, and uh, usually three mechanics. So are there other areas um, that have the same like the snow blowers taking the snow away other yep. than you know. Yeah, we, we do typical our our motor operations do places where there is either meter parking or there's business businesses associated with it. That usually happens first. So Florence usually happens during the daytime and downtown happens at night because there's just too many too much traffic and uh way too much pedestrian traffic to be safe. Um, and then the following day we will start to pick away at the neighborhood. So we'll go into places uh, typically Market Street and Holly Street where it's very narrow and there's a lot of cars that park there. There we go. People we'll just work in and out of those streets um, and we actually pull signs. And most people are pretty good. They will move their cars even though there's no parking van. Mm -hmm. They will move them. Um, and then if we have the signs up long enough, if they're up for 48 hours, the police department will reluctantly tow them during the daytime, but it doesn't happen very often. Richard, I had a resident on the board so much respect for what was done. And she was under hospice, okay, very ill. And nurses from the Cooley deck had to go into that home 24 hours a day on, on shift hours. And I went to the director of the Department of Public Works to tell him there was great concerns because this woman didn't have very much time to live. And they were awesome. You know, they said, Counselor, we will make sure when there's bad storms that that road will be cleared for those nurses to come into that house. And we did, Patty. It was amazing. And it was the family could not believe how much care was given by our director of somebody under hospice with a very short life. Well, I think it's important to people need help. Exactly. Otherwise, the nurses couldn't get in there. So it's it's a it's a lot of work, and in the meantime, while all this while all these we're all plowing and doing all these different things, there's mechanics behind supporting us all. You know, we have a we have a four full time mechanics, and we have about 160 pieces. Of We've been in no parts, right? <laughs> yeah. And then on top of that, we also have support staff in our administration division that supports us by taking all the phone calls, dealing with residents, talking to counselors, mm -hmm. um, trying to sort out. Things that need to be done, and then writing the information to me, and then my job is to figure out and get it all accomplished using the people that I have left standing here. So on and so forth. But usually it takes about about a week, four days usually to get back up on our feet, running 100 after a six-inch snowstorm. Um, you wouldn't know it because you wouldn't, you know, you know, you got to turn around, and put it in the air, attempt some breaks, but a lot of stuff that breaks. And typically we spend. Last year we spent virtually almost three quarters of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. in some years. That was awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So between buying supplies for salt, um, which is extremely expensive over time, yeah. and uh, equipment repair and parts, materials, and uh, about three quarters of a million. And it's only gotten more expensive because fuel prices have risen. Hopefully this year will be a little different. But so nice that the only account we're allowed to deficit spend is Council of Arches, where Basically, a quick overview of how the operation runs. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but it's, you know, I don't know if anybody has any questions. But the other thing I wanted to talk about as well is that I talked about a lot of street plowing, but we also provide sidewalk plowing. So we are responsible for plowing all the municipal sidewalks that abut either municipal 
property or municipal buildings. So we have two bombardiers, which is a small trap machine with a bomb that forms a tank. Just, you mean by municipal buildings? Correct. Yeah, well, municipal property, meaning, for example, like Florence Fields, we call the sidewalk at Florence Fields, there's no building there per se, and it's not active, but we have to actively follow the sidewalk. We also follow the sidewalks, basically, from the Academy of Music, all the way down to Crafts Avenue, uh, because that's basically all city owned property with the exception of the United Church. So, so, so here are custodians? Correct. Right yes, and so, so there, there's a patchwork of, so there's a patchwork of different folks that do different things, so, the department, the DPW is responsible for the sidewalks that are in front of, um, there's about six miles worth of sidewalk that we plow, all these little different pieces everywhere. Um, that's one example that I gave you. Florence Fields is another, uh, in front of Bridge Street Cemetery on Bridge Street, there's a uh -huh. section of sidewalk. Lamprey Park in front of Bridge Street School. So when it comes down to individual facilities, the facilities are managed by central services. So for example, the custodian here cleans the sidewalks here. But at, at uh, JFK School, the custodians and the, the school department. And Ryan Road School sidewalk? Right. Yep. They have all of this, the school department plows its own sidewalks internally. Only thing we do is we plow their parking lots for them. Now, the bike path, a lot of times I'll notice the bike path has been plowed before a street. That's right. So, is there a priority with the no, bike path? No, the reason that's plowed is because there's different entities plowing the bike path. Okay. So, our responsibility for plowing the bike path is from Stoddard Street all the way to Florence Street and Leeds. Okay, yeah. So that's all that we do. So the bike path that is downtown here that runs from Veterans Field all the way over to uh, behind Taco Bell at one time was plowed by two different folks. Part was the parking commission and the other part was the bid. Oh, right so the here. bid the bid used to plow all, used to clean all the sidewalks in downtown for part, bid participants. Mm -hmm. Used to do a section of the bike path from Pleasant Street going over by the old depot and then actually going across the bike paths to Taco Bell. Last year, because the bid was expanded in the middle of winter, that volume stopped. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's part of the conversation that we're going to have, I believe, on to look at all the other folks in the room, which is police, fire, the mayor's office, uh, Louis Hasbrook, uh, Dave Pomerantz. So I, I'm not sure how that's going to how that's going to be sorted out. One of the bid downtown here in Northampton, um, they always made sure the curb cuts because that's really a big uh, concern by people, yeah. and that's what I get phone calls about. People weren't shoveling in the curb cuts because a lot of people, and Michael, you probably can even attest to this, has to go out in the road because the sidewalk and the curb cuts aren't done. But the bid was excellent in keeping the curb cuts downtown um, free and clear. Yeah, on, on the last the last two pages of the little packet I gave you is the, the newest ordinance that we have for uh, mm -hmm. for stone removal from sidewalks. Yes. The city of the Street Council of Arts Stone Road and some of the other as well. Um, and it basically lines out in that large paragraph A who's responsible for doing what. And it says the owner responsible for a building structure or lot of land bordered in any street, lane, court, square, or public place within the city. Where there is a sidewalk, including any curb cut, ramp shall be, uh, shall after snow has ceased, fall <coughs> thereupon, there or whatever, whenever snow shall have collected or deposited upon any such sidewalk, within 24 hours remove the same or cause the same to be removed from such sidewalk. So basically, it's saying that downtown business association, if they don't have the bid, which we don't presently, they're responsible for the curb cuts um, that are at the intersection of Main and Pleasant, where bid actually really did a good job because they were, you know, they took the burden out of these shop owners thinking about who was going to call the sidewalk. I don't know what, if there was going to be any kind of replacement for that this year, I have no idea. So it's really up to the individual owners. So you may encounter some places that are shoveled fine, and you may encounter places that are not shoveled at all. And the one nice thing, the one nice thing about BID was BID would take the snow and they basically would take all the snow off the sidewalk. You know, there's about 10 feet of sidewalk panel on Main Street that's concrete, and then there's a small five foot section that's brick by the meters. It would take everything and put it right, it's right out in the street. And when we came and did our cleanup that following night, we would actually take all that snow and we would deposit it right in the center of Main Street, which allowed the sidewalk to be basically clean from the building to the curb. Most of the 
shop owners that have hired folks, they don't typically do that against piled around the meters. And so then you have another obstacle because folks can't get can't get from their cars or, or people can't get out of the curb cuts correctly or however it may be. So it's kind of a chronic problem that we used to have. I remember when I first started working on Encore was there. And yeah. have to shovel right. everything by hand into the street. We'd go by and they'd be throwing it at us like this. But it, it worked, but we don't have those kind of personnel in the department. We usually in our Tom Street Chronicle, which is our newspaper that gets published, put in the ordinance at least once, like in November or December, mm -hmm. and then also uh, reminding people what um, the policies are here uh, for our building being open or closed. So just getting people to know about it. So then everything that I went over, if you just kind of multiply that by 10 or 20 times, that's basically what we do every time it's a snowstorm. Plus then we go back and we, you know, there's a lot of residents complaints about sidewalks being filled and people by you know, driving too fast or putting too much snow at the end of my driveway versus my neighbor's driveway. I mean, you can really, it, it can be uh, very daunting at times. So well, a challenge. For there sure. is, there's yeah. a lot of information to digest and you really, you know, you want to provide the best service possible for the residents and try to be fair and equitable. Um, Sometimes you can't be fair and equitable. It's just the way things are. You can't cut a street directly down the middle when you're trying to plow. Or get someone in the middle, you have more snow on one side than the other. But we can try to make people's lives better uh, and by being, you know, trying to communicate with folks all the time. Um, so do you think, um, or maybe there's a policy here. I'm sure there's certain guidelines on how um, a worker plows, but are they looking at not trying to put um, snow piles at the end of a sidewalk, um, like trying to figure, because I know sometimes there's probably nowhere to put it. Um, so. Typically, that's usually done because, I'll be truthful with you, when I first started plowing a long time ago, I had a plow that just went up and down, and this is a fixed angle plow. So I had to, you had to be taught how to plow streets. Now people have plows that are, that are up and down, plus they are four way. Mm -hmm. okay. So your natural inclination is when you get to the, the street that has the sidewalks right here, where you would want to go with your wheelchair, and you're like, oh, let's just push this down here, push this down here, and we're going to drive down the street. That's really about education. And so my job at the end of the snowstorm after I plow is I go around in my own pickup truck and I identify these areas and things happen, and I talk to the drivers, and I make the drivers go back and try to clean off the ends of the sidewalks. And then I also deal with complaints. But typically, it's really about just how to plow properly and how to take your, the snow down the street instead of depositing it at the end so people can use the um, handicap accessible ramps or if they have, if there isn't one, they just step up on the curb. Or a resident who has to shovel a giant mound. That's the other problem, because the residents get really upset. They awesome. shovel a path about this big. Yeah. So uh, I'm very well aware of it and I'm always, it's like the first one or two snowstorms, it's like they're gonna have to re-educate everybody. I don't know why, it's just, I haven't forgotten it, but everyone else needs to Well, even a lot of the homeowners have it shoveled with one shovel, you know, whip, mm -hmm. when somebody like with Michael's um, chair could never get through it. And a lot of times, and not only like wheelchairs, but you know, mothers or fathers yeah. pushing carriages or strollers around the road. So it's like, that's, that's, that's the problems that we've had on Ryan Road. But you know, we do have people who call and say, we cannot ask us for this little pass. And then we have somebody like Stu Estes, who is excellent. The whole width of the sidewalk, and last year we ran a problem with that, and on the ordinance, on the language, and he does his neighbors mm -hmm. with his um, regular snow blower. Yeah. All of a sudden the cloud comes by, it's all over the sidewalk again. This is what upsets the residents. You know, they're older. The curb cutting part of it, he said that a plow came and covered that whole curb cut. Well, too, a lot of times what happens is that residents will take the snow, instead of taking the snow in the snow bar and throwing it into the yard, they will take it and throw it back out into the street. Why not? Because, because, you, because, because you throw it back on the sidewalk. there's an ordinance that says you can't. The ordinance that says you can't. I know, and I know that. The point. other issue is, is that it creates a hazard for the drivers. So when we go to do our final cleanup before we are done, this is inevitably like in the morning when people finally wake 
up at six or seven in the morning after the storm and they're cleaning. This is where you have a lot of incidences where drivers are trying to clean their roof and residents are trying to get out of their driveways and the sidewalks and the snow. Man, the piles last year were huge trying to come out of their huge driveways. Well, that's last year, you know, we had so much snow and we never had any melting. That's awful. Such a cold winter. Yeah, it so. just kept coming. And everybody realized that. I think everybody was very respectful last year. We were fortunate. We didn't have as much snow as Boston. We ended up with about 18 inches. What were you saying, Ruth, about your driveway? You were telling me how the plow always does what to it? Oh, the curb. When you come out to the end of the driveway, you know, we have a, a, one of those asphalt curb things there. Like mm -hmm. Yeah, they dig it up every year and every spring. We kind of patch it back in ourselves. <laughs> It's going to be hard to know where the end of the... It, it is. That happened how long do we remember? Yeah. And then if you have a, a winter where you don't have a deep frost prior to your first snow event, typically we have a lot of lawn damage and a lot of anything that's any curbing that's loose will get, get moved exactly. because the plows will hit the curbing and then slowly behind this off it's not frozen. Last year we had, everything was pretty much frozen, so we don't have a lot of plow damage, but there's been some years where we've had a lot of plow damage. And they are saying we're going to have another bad winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it had already been hit out the first like three years ago. I think it just keeps coming out every year. Where, know, where do you live? Fifty-two on you, Richard. Remember, I right called you the plow on the corner coming off of Brookside Circle. <laughs> that residents were complaining because the piles were so high that they had difficulties coming out of there. So the plow came and dug up the whole corner of. Yeah, well, front and lower. Yes. And then it also happened on Acrebrook because I had called you on that one. The same thing happened. Yeah. It's kind of the, it's kind of a drawback. It's kind of hard sometimes to gauge where the where the ground is versus how much snow is there, and then you end up with right. a heavy machine like that and ends up doing some damage. But you know, and a lot of us, like on Route 66, we all paid for our own curbing way back when you built your homes. And then with the reconstruction of Route 66, naturally, that was there, in place there. So, I don't know if you paid for yours. We did. I don't know if people before us did or, or who did. I, I have no I idea. I don't know. When we bought the house, it was already there, so. <clears throat> so I about, think that whole street, a lot of the houses on her street need to have new curbs. Oh, well, I think I'm going to just the street itself. It's the street. So yeah. so I hope for some newer sidewalks out in your area. Oh, good. I would love to have some yeah. curbs. Yeah. Curbs, so. yeah. Does um, anybody have any more questions no. for Rich? Because I no, thank no. you for spending much more yes, time with us than I did. You, if, you come, if you have any thoughts or concerns that you want me to bring up to this, we have our annual So Nice meeting on October 5th. If you have any things you, you know, would like me to try to address. Yeah, well, when is that? Yeah. Where, though? That's usually an administrative meeting. It's, it's in the City Hall hearing room in the mayor. Good, I'll send you some. Okay. And isn't it lucky we're not going to have any snow this week? It, it, it is. You're, you're, we're not going to have anything. It's just going to be warm, just like it is right now. That's right. And if that were to happen, I would be, I would be out of business probably. <laughs> uh, Ruth has another question sure. about a stoplight. Do you have time to well, stay? We had already talked about it. I just wanted to update the commission. We had talked, and the commission had told me to go ahead and call Rich about the stoplight at the corner of. Um, Main and Elm oh, and South Street. Um, three times I had seen people almost get hit. Once was right. in a wheelchair. Um, so I talked to Rich about it, and what we found, what I found out, was that that stoplight is old and can't be updated. So it has a right arrow, which means you're supposed to be able to turn right. That was right. That arrow, you know, when that arrow goes away, you're not supposed to turn right, even though you have a green light, because oh. you lose your arrow. So the pedestrians do have the right of which they always have the right of way anyway, but right. the cars yeah. are supposed to stop. Yep. And what we talked about was there was a traffic study done there. And Rich suggested I email Wayne Fine because nobody seems to know what happened to it after it was done. So I did email him. I haven't got a response back yet. But if they're going to replace those lights, then the problem will be solved. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, I don't even know if it's possible, but if they're short of funding and that one light needs to be replaced to solve the problem, I don't even know how much lights are. This is just a straight oh. thought. Maybe oh. we could help toward one because we do have some money. Who should have the money? I think we have some money. I don't know 
I know nothing about it. I'm just it, it would, throwing ideas out. That's not our job to do that. It, it, would cost, it, would cost, it would cost a lot of money. I think the, the issue that I was explaining to Ruth is that when you're sitting at a, when you're on St. Mary's Hill, right. you're, you're at all of your stop, all three lanes, you're going towards Main Street. When the green arrow comes on to turn left on the State Street, the green arrow from Main Street comes on, you turn left on to New South Street. That's the pedestrian phase for the diagonal crosswalk. That only lasts for 20 seconds. What sure. happens, and the problem is okay. because it's called a time phase, so you, you, if you were to walk up to that and press the button, you're not gonna, the button doesn't work for that particular diagonal crosswalk. That is just a time in, in, in that sequence of all those lights changing. Right. So when the arrows come on, then if you're on the corner, you want to make a bolder dash to the other side, okay. you can do so. Um, the issue with that is what happens is that people get trapped in there, right. and when the red arrow, the green arrow turns, you know, yellow, and then it turns to red, yeah. now the traffic that wants to go down Main Street from St. Mary's Hill and vice versa are crossing that diagonal, and that person who's in that diagonal is in jeopardy of getting hit. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work like a normal crosswalk where you press the pen button, right. and then eventually you'll get the priority mm -hmm. and you'll get people across the street. So that's the reason why that crosswalk has not been painted in a long time. But unfortunately, the head, the head system still works there. And I don't really know what the resolution is. I have talked to the director about it. But we haven't come up with. He was trying to see if we could actually take that 20 seconds and extend it for a longer period of time, which would mean the traffic would get stacked up a little differently. But we haven't got that far yet. That's well, a does that come down? Tour of facing Main Street, South Street's on my right, and I've come down Elm Street. Yeah. They got that light right there. If I want to turn right down South Street, or is that Old South? I that, that's New South. South. Right. South. Yeah. People push the light, the cross light changes right here for them to start walking at the exact same time as my light turns green to go down there. Right, but people are still turning. So people were turning on top of the pedestrians as they were brought as they were. Right. The people driving see the green light, the pedestrians see right. the crosswalk, and right. neither it's, one realizes the other one's going to be there. That's a big, I told Ruth that I understand her concerns, and all of us counselors have heard about this, and I think the Department of Public Works is attempting to try whatever they can to solve that problem, and I understand where she's coming at, but it's an issue that everybody has concerns about. Yeah, well, we Good. The committee authorized me to call Rich, so I figured I'd just update you on what we found out. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Good. thank you, Rich. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. Go thank home. She <laughs> said <laughs> <laughs> that. Is that the most you need to not get hold of me? People let yeah. you go home. On a very rare occasion. I actually want to hold and change. I, I do have all the clothes on the car. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a lot of these are just like quick answers for what right. we're doing. Um, the next order of things on the agenda today is the banner. Yeah. Um, I believe Ruth might have. That's me. Um, banners over there. Oh. Uh, this was the banner that um, we oh, purchased. Wow. We have the other smaller banner, but right. this is the bigger one. We still need to get the pole for that. This is perfect. Yeah, yeah. You, meant to, you, went, you know, when you measured, we said the t size of the table. Yes. So, yeah. So Good there job. it is. Oh, yeah, I love the color, Good too. Good job. Yeah. It's very nice. So there you go. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Patty. Yeah. Right side. Yeah. 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 Y
because he wanted to reply back to let everybody know of what he has heard so far. So he did send all of us an email yes. um, just saying, and he's away, that's why he isn't at our meeting um, today, but um, so he, it's being discussed and um, he'll let us know. Um, Do you, Ruth had brought this to my attention today where about more healing. I, I don't see that. I just see discussion on the round table event with potential guest speaker more healing. I didn't have that. All I had was agenda item calling more healing. Oh, I thought that, that she was going to be here. Yeah, that's what she um, thought. That's that Tori put an agenda together and then um, Councilor Labarge called or left an email yeah. or whatever. Um, so that I changed it. So oh, I just didn't see the change. Yeah. Um, and it was, I didn't either. Because yeah. it was, I think you know, you know, Tori was considerate enough to finish the agenda, you know, the last agenda for us. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, she put down what the topics were and didn't expand on those. So yeah, was yeah. And if if Maura Healy was here, we would have said it, you know, invited guest or guest speaker or new business or something. <laughs> Um, so anyway, that, that sounds like it's underway, and um, Mr. Palamas is yep. working on that, as he said he would. And he's on vacation right yep. now. Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. oh. Holiday party. Oh, great. Yeah, who, whose idea was that, or what's, whose is that? Uh, Not mine. We just brought it up. Somebody had talked about, were we going to have another party, holiday party? Mm -hmm. I'm too busy. I'm... I'm, I'm I think that's I'm up to the commission, you know, it's like... Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we can sort of... If, it's, if people are too busy, let's... Exactly. Like yeah. that. Well, I think also um, part of the um, discussion was not even having a meeting in December because December is just such a busy month for everybody. But that... Patty, you would have to um, put that under new business. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's not on the agenda. Yeah, okay. In and, and any way, we can't decide anyway because nobody can vote on anything today. Yeah. Yeah, so sure. that should be, I'm going to make a list of what we should do for the next agenda. Yeah. Should we could add a different, so for, it would be better if we had like an earlier meeting during the month. For like when? For December, like how? For switching it? The second Tuesday, right? No. I, I would like to see that if we could possibly not have a meeting in December. Right now, social services, veterans, cultural, and recreation, us counselors made a decision not to have a meeting because of the week of December 22nd. Mm -hmm. A lot of families are going right. away, and it's like, I won't be here in December. Well, won't be here well you know, like I said, just if we can, if it makes sense to have it on a different Okay, so I'll put that on the agenda for October, the discussion about yes. the December meeting. Yeah. And so whatever people have as thoughts, and then right. we can vote on it. Right. Okay. But I can let you know I won't be here. The next item on the agenda is brochure. It's brought to us by Ruth McGrath me in person. I, I gave these out last meeting and asked everybody if they would take them and make any changes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, suggestions, um, fillers for the spaces I left blank, some of the things that, you know, just so that I could coordinate them, put them together, and come up with another draft with everything on it. But did anybody even look at them? Yeah, I, I did. Um, Can I see yeah. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. I would like to table that. Yeah. Because I have not had the opportunity to look at it because of being so busy right now. So, what do you think if we in October sure. have that on? Because I actually went after the, the meeting, I worked on that a little bit. Yeah. Because what I'm going to say about that so far is it seems like it's all about the ADA coordinator and not really what the commission is yeah and um, i did like i said duplicated yeah. pieces just to put fillers to keep things yeah. out yeah but thank you for putting that together it's a great start so if there is an agreement um well no okay. what i'll do is i'll put it on the october agenda yeah. right so um Next 
item on our agenda is the update on Daniel Langer. So um, our previous chair uh, sent him an email because the discussion was about if um, he wanted to remain or not. And um, from the response, it appears that he is going to resign. So that can be the official resignation and that will uh, go to the mayor's office is it, if it hasn't already. It is an official re resignation or is it just you are reading it, you take the appearance of? Well, he had a, a he was, Tori gave him a deadline, like I need to hear from you All by right. so and so. So um, by appearances, it, uh, it is that he's resigning. But Tori wrote a wonderful um, email to him um, and said, you know, if you aren't going to be on the committee, you're always welcome. Has anybody exactly. really Has anybody welcome yeah. to come to the meetings to speak? So. Right. When I was at Danny's house a month ago, I had asked him that Patty apparently was sending emails to him. And he said he had a computer problem. And Wendy Foxman went over to his house and his computer was fine. She checked it out and everything. Yeah, and called me too and I looked at it. Uh huh? Yeah. He called me too and I looked at it and it was fine. Yeah, see. So, but he did even tell me, you know, he said he can't guarantee to be here all the time. Yeah. And, you know, and then I told him the same thing, Patty, that he can come whenever he wants. Yeah. He right. can yeah. sit in the open and, public. Right. And I would like to yeah, add the, the person that's taking care of him doesn't drive either. No. So uh, that's our, our transportation. Yeah, I'd like to add the minutes too to thank him for all his years of service. Yep. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Very, yeah. very much so. And again, we hope Dan will come to some yeah. of our meetings. Right. Yeah, we'll make sure that he's here when we um, have more Healy here because he, you know, he is very knowledgeable about what's happening statewide and good uh, to have him. Other business. One more. Sure. We got a letter from Lisa Downing at Forbes Library. She's been in here to speak before. They are presenting Now Hear This. It's an introduction to communication techniques, assistive listening, and visual alerting devices. It's on Wednesday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. at Forbes Library. And she does advise that the elevator is still not working. So the Forbes Library is not wheelchair accessible yet. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Did they have a digi indicated on when that might alter? No. no. Not in this email. I haven't talked to her in a couple of weeks. So. If you want, I can find out when they have an anticipated date of when it might be. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. We did have a meeting in there two weeks ago. And um, it's still all wrapped up in plastic, and the board is still inside. Yeah. You know, the, I'm on the advisory committee. Oh, you like oh, join that? Yeah. Oh, sounds yeah. like a nice it's committee. It's fun. It's, it's really great. You're on the what? Advisory committee for Forbes Library. Does that have a whole like position? No. Oh, okay. You could join it, too, if you yeah. wanted. Oh. As soon as we can get you in the library. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I can do the stairs. It's hard, but I can do it. Yeah, either that or try to get on it. Just get pressure on it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You want me to give you her phone number or her email? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa held the first meeting here, um, and there was a nice, I don't know if it, were you at it, Ruth? No, I missed Because the there was a nice turnout of people to um, be on that advisory committee. How many members on an advisory committee? I don't know how many. I think anybody who uh, wanted to right. be on it. I can oh, tell yeah. you. Yeah, do you know what it is? Yeah, she sent me the minutes. It went to all the members. Russ Carey over there. Oh, we have no, no email, no internet connection on that one. Let's see if I still have it on here. Yeah. Let's see the minutes. I can email it to you tonight too if you want. 
No, the trust was on the board of trustees. I've never heard about the advisory committee. It, it just it was formed. Yeah, it's brand new. Within the they last just couple formed months. it. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to know how many people are on it. Yeah, that I don't know. Yeah, I, I, that I do have. And then we only had one meeting. The next one, I have my calendar with me. There's still not. And what does the advisory committee do? Um, we're looking at right now different things to do in the library to um, assist people with disabilities that come in. Like there's whiteboards now at all the counters with all the um, where we can check out books, check in books upstairs at the reference life desk. So if people come in that can't hear, they can write right on the whiteboard. They're, they're about this big. Oh, oh time of your meetings. It varies. It's going to vary. And we didn't have the first one at the library because of the elevator. It was here. Um, the next one, the elevator was supposed to be up. We have. A couple of people wheelchairs, mobility issues, we have a couple of blind people, Barbara Black is on it. Um, so this is for disabilities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We, we're working saying. with the computers, we're working with um, books, we're going to start a reading for deaf children. We're going to have somebody come mm -hmm. in and sell signed children's books. Um, all sorts of different stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's what we're working So with. basically it's for disability. Yep. Yeah, and everybody's your participants. That's just, yeah. I, 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 so usually if it's like the trustees, that's an elected position. Right, that's, that's oh, yeah, this is not, yeah. this is not. They emailed me, Lisa emailed me and asked me if I would be on it, and I said, sure. Thank you, Ruth, for that update. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any announcements? No. All right. Um, does anybody have new any new business? Not I. Discussed. The new business was going to be about having a not being able to have a meeting in December. So that was. Yeah. So I'll put that on before October. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 